Well, this is the day. This is the day. On our calendar, and together with millions of people throughout the world, our expressions on this day may vary. However, our focus on this day is, is all the same. This is the day that we celebrate, that we commemorate, that we recognize, that we rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Laid in the grave on Friday, sealed in the tomb for Saturday, this is the day, Sunday. There is no other more pivotal occasion in all of the world's history than the purpose of this day. Everyone has to contend with what happens on, our, on this day. Well, we've just come through our basketball season with Upward. And again, this year I had the opportunity to coach a team, uh, to, to uh, learn from them, to have some fun with them, and, and to be able to coach them a little bit. Hopefully they learned a little bit too. But part of what I try to do uh, with those students at, at this age, kind of grade four and five students, I think, is how old they are. Um, what I try to do with them is, is try to teach them how to get ready. Game days are big days. Everybody wants to play. But you can't play unless you're ready. And it's something that they're excited to participate in, and it's made all the better. I try to tell them over and over again, if you're ready, you'll get more out of that game experience. And one of the keys to getting ready is the position of your arms. Now, I could make Albert come up here and do this, but I won't. <laughs> when I watch players on my team, I'm always watching for what they're doing with their arms. Whether they're out to their side, right? They're ready to play defense. Or they're held up, ready for it to rebound a ball, whether it's on the offensive side or on the defensive side, they're ready to go or whether they're held out to receive a pass, or whether they're held up to encourage your teammates with a high five or a pat on the back. What they do with their arms and their hands is so, so important that it's easy to see when they're actually not into the game based on what their arms and hands are doing. When they're confused or discouraged by maybe it's their own performance or the team's performance, it's easy to tell. When those things happen, their, their arms hang low. They often slump their shoulders. They might place their hands on their hips. If they're upset, they'll, they'll cross their arms. If they're upset with me, they'll cross their arms and stare. <laughs> and they'll withhold their hands from encouraging others. They won't give that high five. In frustration, you might see them even just wringing their hands a little bit. Now, you may not play basketball, but you can likely recognize these body language signals. You're more readily notice them in others and less likely that you'll see them reflected in your own experiences. When we get down, when we're confused, when we get angry, when we're unsure, when we lack confidence, our arms hang low, our shoulders slump forward, and our hands, they, they begin to fidget. Resurrection Sunday is a reminder that God is calling us into this game called life, and we need to adopt a posture of readiness because Jesus has won. Sin and death are defeated. We have just sung about that. Therefore, we as followers of Jesus need to have a humble confidence and a readiness to participate in his kingdom plan. This is the day. This is a day that we are reminded of all those things. It's a day, it's a day that a little considered Old Testament prophet talked about 2,600 years ago, right around the time when a young king, the youngest king, Josiah, would ascend to the throne of Judah. At the age of eight years old, Judah understood the priority of realigning his people with the truth of God. In their day, when Judah became king, evil and darkness prevailed. Honoring the Lord was relegated to casual acknowledgement, absent from meaning or reverence. The cultural, mo the cultural movement that fostered hatred, oppression, and even the sacrifice of children in religious practice silenced even those who might speak out on behalf of the Lord. This went on for about 75 years 
until Zephaniah came along. And as you read through this, this short three-chapter letter, you read first about the judgment that God has for the sin of the people that has carried on for so long. However, as we've been learning throughout this series, God with us, God's mercy always precedes his judgment. So this is the day, Zephaniah reminds us, when we recognize that God is our defender. On this Resurrection Sunday, we gather in humility to acknowledge that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, willingly received the punishment for the sin of the world that, that, that we were due to receive. In so doing, God made Christ, who was sinless, take our sin so that we might receive God's approval through him, that being Jesus. Our response, then, is one of praise, one of thanksgiving, one of worship of all that we are. God has done this for us, for the people that he loves. Jesus has made a way for us to enjoy relationship and kinship with him as children of God. Zephaniah says, sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart daughter Jerusalem. And the question is, how has the Lord done this? How has the Lord done this? And verse 15, verse 15 makes this promise of what, it is to look, what, what we ought to look for on this day. He says, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. You know, we all have a desire to belong, to live according to a purpose. But we look for it in different places, don't we? As time goes on, we look for belonging, perhaps, or purpose in more dangerous places. We can sometimes numb ourselves and busy ourselves to the yearning that we have within us. Where are you looking for your purpose? What are you looking for? Or what are you looking to for belonging? And purpose. God says, this is the day. This is the day that we recognize that he is our defender, taking our punishment and prevailing over the enemy. When we are feeling despairing, when we are feeling even desperate, instead of asking where or what, ask a different question. Learn to ask yourself, who? Until we stop looking for temporary feel-good experiences, solutions, and relationships, we'll miss seeing Jesus. Until we stop looking for someone to blame, we'll miss seeing Jesus. If we continually focus on where we have been, we may never recognize the presence of Jesus and find our identity and our purpose as a child of God. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, John chapter 20. And you can kind of keep a marker there because we'll come back to, to this passage uh, a few different times. In John chapter 20 in the New Testament. And starting in verse 11, we read these words. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I, I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. But Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. The most pivotal event in all of history is revealed to this woman 
here in the ancient Middle East. All four gospel writers share different circumstances around the, the resurrection. All of them, though, share that Jesus is raised from the dead, and through each writer, all of them, all of them have Mary Magdalene as the one to whom is given this most pivotal, life-giving, game-changing truth. Can you see her hands as she approaches the tomb that morning, in the early morning hours? If Jesus didn't rise, then she would be vulnerable again to, to the evil and perhaps to the neglect and the abuse of others. Maybe her arms were, were crossed as she tried to fight the tension that was building inside of her. Has that ever happened to you? All through that Saturday? And maybe her hands were ringing as she turned from the tomb that was surprisingly empty, fidgeting as she wiped away the, the tears that were streaming down her face. All, after all this frenzy of Friday, this was certainly unexpected. Because there is no sounds, there is no announcement being made. There's not even now a, a body. There is absolutely nothing. Mary Magdalene was an outcast until Jesus came near, extended his hands and welcomed her and healed her, invited her to be a disciple. She is the one through whom this news is entrusted. If the desperation in her search is important to not overlook, then so too is the sovereign choice of God to go against societal norms and to declare that the victory has been won through Mary. Mary knew, without a doubt, that this, this is the day to recognize that Jesus was her defender. This is also the day where we recognize that the king of Israel is without a doubt on his throne. Zephaniah 3 in verse 15, the second part of verse 15 says, The Lord, the king of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. You see, the king is on our team. So our hands need to be engaged and ready. The king is on our team. And so we then, as participants, we feed off of, we get our confidence from who he is and what he has done. As the resurrected Christ appears to Mary in the garden, he speaks words of authority. At the ascension, <clears throat> He speaks, he speaks of having to, to ascend to the Father, to his Father, and to her Father, our Father. There's clarity and there's hope that is ignited within Mary. Jesus says, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. It was just a few days previous where Jesus had a discussion with Pilate over kingship and authority. You can look, look a couple chapters back in the Gospel of John to find that. And as a result, P Pilate himself would acknowledge the counterintuitive nature of God's kingdom. And he would say, you are a king. And then Jesus would pin him on those words. He said, well, you are saying that. See, Pilate was confounded. He was in awe of the willful submission of Jesus to the abuse and the deception of his accusers. It's all seemed very plain to Pilate. And perhaps Pilate, with arms hanging low, shoulders slumped forward, wringing his hands under the water, to wipe away his guilt, he as he, he agrees to reluctantly submit to the will of the people and sentences Jesus to be crucified. But he also chose to 
affix three signs over Jesus, each one with the title King of the Jews and written in the language of the three dominant, written in the three dominant languages of the time. So whether Pilate understood the prophetic messages from centuries before, the promises of God, or even the covenant for an eternal king that would come, we don't know. But what we do know is that Pilate understood this, that Jesus, Jesus was a king. That was clear. We are a people in general with arms held low with hands hanging limp. Despite our relative prosperity compared to most other countries in the world, we have a growing number of people who carry themselves with a posture of hopelessness. This past week, I don't know whether you picked this up in the news or not, uh, Dr. Kieran Moore, the provincial chief medical officer, presented a proposal to tighten restrictions on alcohol while also decriminalizing some harder drugs in an effort to try to deal with the growing addiction crisis. At this point, the, the provincial government has rejected this proposal. However, it will, probably won't be the last proposal. And at minimum, it demonstrates a, a hand-wringing at the escalation of damage that is being done to individuals and families and communities over these last number of years. On a global level, Canada ranks first. We're number one in its openness to medical assistance in death or MAID. And while acknowledging the growing complexities that arise as a result of scientific advances and the longevity of life, our, our country is seeking ways to even widen what already is, widen the scope of what already is, so that more people could choose death in the time to come. And if it's only for this life that we have hope, and it's certainly and it's only with a, with a certainty of perfect days, then we, of all people, should be pitied. Did you know Canada also ranks fourth in the world in the consumption of online sexual ex exploitation? We are at the top in oppressing others, destroying their lives in the name of entertainment because we have the capital to do that. In contrast to Pilate, and as a signal to us in our current Canadian context, we need to be people who recognize that this is the day. The kingdom of God is one of peace, of unity, and of flourishing. We should not let our, hang, our hands hang limp. We gather to celebrate the risen Christ as, a, as recipients of this message that was accompanied by the enthusiastic hands of Mary. Could you imagine what that must have looked like to the disciples to have Mary Magdalene come into their space, her hands would be like this, right? I've seen the risen Lord. She would not be like this. Too many of us who say we believe in Jesus walk around like this. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We ought to be prepared to engage the game of life, but we are not. We look at our coach like this. Are you kidding me? We're behind in this game of life? We got the king on our team. And this is the day, then, that we also remember we walk with the mighty warrior. He's not just any player. He's the best player that's ever been. Zephaniah continues in, chapter, in verse 17. He says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great, in delight. He will take great delight in you, in his love. In his love, you will no longer re he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The imagery, the imagery of a mighty warrior might conjure up all kinds of different pictures in your mind, depending on your era and your influences. However, be very clear on this. The victory that is secured, and it is, the victory of that is secured and the weapon of war is the word of God. 
The sword is his truth. This is the image that the Apostle John saw in the opening chapter of Revelation and is the means by which God deals with people all throughout the unfolding of history. He holds all people against the eternal perfection of his word. So this is the day that evil was disarmed. In the silence of Saturday, the scripture tells us that, reminds us that Jesus in declare, went to declare his victory over the evil spirits. You see, even when Mary couldn't see it, when she was busy wringing her hands and wondering, oh, what is going on? God was at work. His weapon was his word, and in so doing, Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities in making their physical efforts a, a public spectacle. Yes, he submitted to and absorbed the worst of their abuse, even submitting himself to the point of death. When the power of God raised Jesus from the dead, he triumphed over them. His presence pronounced a victory over evil. So this is the day then when sin and death are also defeated. The defeat of death gives way to vi the vibrancy of life. And Zephaniah reminds us that the droning dirge of death gives way to the celebratory song of victory over our lives. Can you hear that? Jesus singing over your life because you say, I want to live to honor him. Included in that uh, Angus Reed poll that I mentioned earlier is the question of life after death. The majority of people surveyed agree that there is life after death. We're not clear as a society on how that becomes possible, but Jesus clears this up for us. You see, we live with a barrier between death and life. Many of us are fearful of even talking about the decline, our declining days uh, as our earthly life seems to give way. However, the resurrection of Jesus Christ enables us, those who place their faith in him, to experience peace, fullness, and wholeness, even as our earthly days draw to a close. Through the cross of Christ, where he died, we experience life because he lives. Jesus' response to our questions of life isn't to live your life and hope for some kind of afterlife, hope for a resurrection, wish for it. Hopefully that's good. I've, I've done enough to deserve that. His response is, this is the day. Choose to believe in him identify with him in his death and then experience life knowing that our eternal life is assured. God gives us the capacity to live every day, to make every day count and to live according to the victory that he has secured. As we do this, as we do this, his spirit by the strength that his spirit gives, he then prepares us for eternal life to come. It's his way, according to his truth, that leads to life with the Father. We are invited to identify with Christ in the power of his resurrection, through the participation of, in his sufferings. You see, it's resurrection, then life. Our lives are resurrected when we place our faith in Jesus so that we can live. Death, then living. Every day is a reason to live according to the victory song of Jesus that he is singing over our lives. Today, this is the day. You see, this is the day we live in the light of victory. Verses 18 to 20 in, in Zephaniah it goes on to say this. It says, because Jesus lives, we are invited into a vibrant relationship with God that even frustrates the failings and the constraints of religious norms. Did you know that? Zephaniah says it this way. He says, I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. 
At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. You know, and while it is true that we can be very much like Mary wanting to cling and possess the fullness of the victory of Jesus and not leave him, not leave it, he knew and she was reminded that there was work yet to be done. He knew and we are reminded that there will yet be a day when Jesus will return and all the world will know that he is king of kings and he will inaugurate his eternal kingdom that will not end. And there will be a day, the timing of which we do not know. Therefore, we must be ready now and act upon that which has been entrusted to us today. Every day from here on out, we get to choose to listen to his voice, to be guided by his counsel, and to be led by his spirit. This is the day, today, where we no longer walk with arms hanging low. And I'm going to do something that I thought about. Boy, this, is gonna, this could mess things up real bad. But you're going to help me. I'm going to coach you. And some of you are going to go like this. And I can deal with it. I've had an eight-year-old glare at me, and, and they can glare. So we're kind of used to this, right? When we sit, or something changes. See, posture, your posture, it, it influences how you feel. So here's what I want you to do. Slowly, for some of you, this will be the first time. I want you to lift your hands up. For some of you, it's the first time. I know. How many of you feel strange? Feel awkward? That's, that's all right. Strange? Yeah, thank you for that admission. That's great. Okay, you can put them down. To stretch out our hands, to lift up our hands. What do we do then? Right? God says, do not let your arms hang limp. Do not let your arms hang limp. As Mary stretches out her hands to try to embrace Jesus, we too can reach out our hands as though we are just a, as a declaration that we need this relationship with Jesus. That we are not who we often think we are. And we are not what our past failures have taught us that we might be. Instead, we have been brought, we are rescued, we are redeemed, and we are sent out. We are sent out to share the presence and the influence of the risen Christ in our life with others. And to do so is an act of worship, which is why we stretch out our hands. It's an act of submission in as much as it's an act of longing for the eternal completeness of the new heavens and the new earth to which our King, which our King holds for us. Now I want you to take your hands. Just your hands. You don't have to hold them all the way up. Take your hands, and I want you to open them up. Now tell me, where in the scripture does it tell you to close your hands to pray? Do you know where? Absolutely nowhere. I know it's crazy. Open, we open our hands. It's okay to close your hands. I'm not saying it's wrong. Go ahead. You can put your hands back down. I'm not saying it's wrong to close your hands in prayer. It's true that most of us practice praying in that way. Historians believe that came from, the, from these first generations of Christ followers. They were using a Roman practice of surrender, so the Romans would have them close their hands as a declaration that they were surrendering, and then they would get shackled. And so the Christians at that, and those first Christians, historians tell us, use that same symbol of the closed hand as a recognition that they are surrendering to God. However, the opening or the spreading out of our hands before the Lord, see, see how that changes your posture? It's very different. When we open and we spread out our hands before the Lord, it's an acknowledgement and a readiness to receive that which he has for us. 
we follow the example of Moses and Ezra and others who take this posture, acknowledging that they do not possess the resources that they need to, to be able to deal with what lies before them, but they're ready to receive what God has to teach them. And so they pray with open hands before the Lord. Thirdly, we are to engage our hands in service. we got to be ready, right? we got to be ready. Our hands are not meant to be idle, stuffed in our pockets and withdrawn from others. From extending and greeting to tenacious willingness to work hard to the merciful touch in response to the needs of others around us, we are, in keeping with the example of Jesus, to engage our hands in service. This is the day. We extend our hands in worship. We open our hands in prayer. And we are prepared to work hard with our hands as an extension of the mercy of Jesus. To speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave is to speak of hope. It's to understand purpose. It's the means by which our lives are shaped for if the resurrection of Christ is true and we, as we, and we gather as those who affirm this truth, then the fear of death, the fear of dying, the fear of this world has no hold on us. There's nothing that we cannot do that the Lord will call us to. To speak of resurrection is to recognize there are parts of our present lives that we consider unworthy, that we consider not good enough. There are questions that we possess, uncertainties with which we live, hardships that we have endured, darkness from the past failures that still cast long shadows, guilt of our past mistakes whose weight prevents us from moving forward, living the life that, that Jesus wants us to live. And all of these things need resurrection. They need to be submitted to Christ through his sacrifice. They need to be left in silence allowing the miraculous and mystifying power of God to work in them. They need to be allowed to lay dormant so that they can be raised to life with Christ. Therefore, we must be those who watch, who wait, and who who ready ourselves to serve our God with all that we are in everything that we do with everyone that we meet. Jesus is calling you and me by our names according to the unique purpose that he has for us, just like he did for Mary. And like Mary, Jesus will send you to others who need him most, the oppressed, those who are otherwise excluded, those who suffer, You see, this is a day that Jesus is calling your name to go, to show, and to share his story of victory through your life, even the parts that the world says isn't good enough, trusting in the power that raised Jesus from the dead to be displayed in your life. Jesus wants you to tell them that God loves them. He wants you to show them by the way in which you use your arms and your hands because he wants to honor them so that they can hear the song of victory. This is the day. Jesus is risen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. I'll have the music team come up as well. So, Father, as we gather today, this is the day. And so, God, we first say thank you, hallelujah, we give you praise and glory that nothing could hold you down. We thank you for your life given for us, but we thank you all the more for the power that raised Jesus from the dead, for revealing that to Mary and having her share that story so that we could know. God, forgive us for continuing to live as those with arms who hang low. God, you love us. You love us so much, and you know our names. Forgive us for ignoring that purpose, for hiding behind our failures, for deciding for you whether we're good enough or not. 
God, we thank you that you love us so much. Thank you for Jesus. Today is a day. As you hear the prayer of your people, God, there are new starts being made today. New declarations, a new willingness to engage, maybe a new openness to understand, a longing for our eternal home. God, maybe a new openness to have your resources, your wisdom equip us for what we deal with on this day. And God, maybe a new ambition to serve in your name. And God, maybe above all else, there's a recognition that we have ignored your call, your name. And so may we turn to you and say, yes, Jesus, we want to follow the risen Christ. May today be a day. May this be the day of salvation. God, there are those that you are going to send us to that need to know the, the importance of the resurrection of Jesus, revealed in our lives, not so much in our words. And God, would you send us to that with readiness? And so we give you ourselves in Jesus' name, because this is the day. Amen.